101 podcast, where God is most glorified by his love and provision for all people. Welcome your host, the Director of Apologetics for Texas Baptists, an adjunct professor of theology, and a local teaching pastor, Dr. Leighton Flowers. Hello and welcome back to Sociology 101. Many of you may be aware that there's some back and forth going on between Dr. James White and Dr. Ken Wilson. Now, I'm not going to get into a lot of the details with regard to uh, James White's rebuttal of Ken Wilson's material. Ken Wilson is more than capable of handling that for himself, and I pray that James White will accept his challenge to debate personally over those doctrines and those issues. Um, What I would like to reply to, however, is some of the red herrings that James White continues to kind of plug in to this discussion by uh, taking his attention off of Ken Wilson and focusing it back onto me. Um, And that's what he did in one of his most recent dividing line programs with regard to Clement of Rome. Now, um, as I talked about in my last episode, uh, there are some pseudo-Clementine writings um, that uh, are attributed to Clement by some scholars, but then others uh, have have brought uh, questions to whether that should be uh, attributed to Clement or not. Um, And I read from some of those pseudo-sources in my debate, and I attributed it to Clement. Now, I think James White is perfectly within his right to call those out and to say, uh, those seem like pseudo-sources. We're not sure those are from Clement. It uh, doesn't change the fact that they are early writings, and they are consistent with many of the same writings that we see from Clement and the other early church fathers. And so uh, it's not completely discredited to look at those sources. But I think uh, Calvinists are well within their rights to point out the fact that some of those pseudo-writings are not necessarily from those who are, have the names on them. <clears throat> That's a common uh, practice in those days, oftentimes, uh, to, to uh, attribute to a particular author something that was not necessarily from them. Um, and so uh, James White, instead of focusing on, uh, on Ken Wilson's uh, thesis, which is where I really would rather the focus stay, he instead talked about our debate and talked about my reference to, to Clement from the back and forth discussion that we had. And so that's where I wanted to answer today, because what James White goes on to do in this particular broadcast is he goes on to quote from First Clement, the, the one source that most scholars do believe is truly written by Clement, who's mentioned in the scriptures, by the way, as a, as a bishop there in Rome. And I wanted to correct some of the things that I think James White, uh, some of the errors he makes in this broadcast. One, he, he interprets, of course, Clement much like he interprets Paul and the other New Testament uh, authors um, by assuming, in my estimation, he's assuming that if somebody uses the word elect or the number of the elect or something of that nature, that they must be talking Calvinistically. And of course, that's question begging. That the, the debate, the, the point up for debate is what is meant by uh, the authors of Scripture and thus Clement as well, uh, someone who uh, was long there with the uh, authors of Scripture at the same time that they were. What is their meaning when they reference the elect? And so that's the, that's the issues we want to go over here is to talk through some of those things and to make sure we are not making mistakes as to our interpretation based upon our, our pre, uh, preconceived ideas of what election means. Um, now, again, uh, anybody who tries to deny that they have some preconceptions or some uh, baggage, theological background baggage that's influencing the way they're thinking um, – they're just not being honest. Obviously, we all have our theological baggage. We have our presuppositions. We have the things that have influenced us from our perspective, um, and we all have to acknowledge that. And so anytime you hear James White or others say, well, this person's coming to their conclusion because of their tradition or because of their presupposition, um, well, we could turn that around and say the exact same thing back to James White. We can say, well, you're coming up with your interpretation because of your Calvinistic tradition. Um, and that's just a question-begging argument. It's the it's a very low form of debate. It, it's kind of like the playground, uh uh uh-huh kind of back and forth. Because, it, again, any any question-begging is anytime you can just repeat what the your opponent says, and you can just repeat it back to them without changing a word, you can know that's that's a question-begging argument. And James White uses that quite regularly in his uh, his discussions. And so what I wanted to do is play a portion, at least, of this, where he's dealing specifically with some of my claims. And then we want to look at Clement um, of Rome and some of his teachings in order for us to really understand what is most likely the appropriate uh, interpretation of Clement in the context of Clement's writings. And so let's go through some of that. Teach that this wasn't clearly taught until Augustine. 
who doesn't even teach this view of election until the 5th century. In other words, the way many people understand election today is not the way it was understood throughout Old Testament times. Even though Paul interpreted it that way. Okay, so he says, he's quoting, he's playing my opening statements from the debate. And, um, and so I'm pointing out that no one has interpreted election in this way that Augustine does. Uh, not in Old Testament times. And then, of course, he's making the comment, well, Paul quoted from Old Testament. Now, remember, in his debate with Steve Tassi, as well as in his debate with me, um, both times he says, well, the, these guys over there, non-Calvinists, they want to run to the Old Testament. They want to run to the Old Testament quotes to see what they said there, instead of looking at, quote-unquote, the apostolic interpretation. So what James White is saying there, he did this with John Cramon in the debate on Unbelievable as well, um, this, this concept or idea that, that, that Paul is ultimately taking these quotes from the Old Testament and he is eisegetically reading a new doctrine into them and saying, even though it didn't, it didn't mean this then when he quotes from it, he's, he's using his apostolic interpretation. He's taking this quote from the Old Testament and he's using it to establish a new understanding or a new theology. Um, and that's ultimately what White requires that, that Paul is doing. Now, we don't need that. We, we don't believe that Paul needs to eisegete the Old Testament in order to establish a new doctrine of election. We believe what it meant in the original context is exactly what Paul means when he's quoting from it. Um, and so we don't have to rely upon this misunderstanding or this misnomer that Paul is eisegeting the Old Testament in order to establish this new apostolic interpretation of what election is. And we go over that more in other broadcasts if you're interested. The New Testament times, or any time, until a former Gnostic Manichaean philosopher from Africa, who did not know Greek, came along 300 years after the time of Christ to systematize it for us. Um, yeah, he did not know Greek or Hebrew, though he picked up some Greek later in his life. Um, that much is true. To be honest with you, Leighton, I'm not sure how much of it you know. Is that somehow relevant at this particular point? Yeah, and this is another thing he just brought up recently in Twitter, pointing out somebody's um, uh, inability or lack of ability uh, is just a fact of the matter. So if you have somebody who is being deemed a scholar or somebody uh, that other people are referencing as their scholar or a source, then uh, just like in a, uh, a you know in a courtroom, if you if if the defense attorney attorney puts up a a a, a witness who is an expert in a particular field. Then the then the DA can cross examine that that expert's ability and their capabilities because they're being put up as the expert. Now nobody's putting up little old Leighton Flowers as the expert on all of these things involved. Um, I've told you guys I'm more of a popularizer of the scholars. I'm one who is coming to you, bringing you the scholar sources. I I quote from leading scholars from our perspective in order to establish what I'm saying is true. I'm not claiming myself as the scholar. You've guys heard me enough to say this. Now, some people would like for me to to not do that. A name like Jonathan Pritchett says, hey, you got a doctorate degree. Uh, you're a teacher here at seminary, uh, at our seminary. You know, you can claim to be a scholar. And I, but I just, I know I'm not from the world of academia. Um, I, and I know my limitations. And I'm fine with not being seen as the end-all, be-all scholar of all things. I did take a couple of years of Greek. I know how to read it. I know how to use my tools. Um, I quite honestly don't even try to pronounce Greek correctly because I know my limitations in pronouncing English, <laughs> trying to pronounce all my Greek words exactly correctly. And so um, I, 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 I'm, I limit myself on those things, and, and rightly so. I, I, and that's, that's the difference maybe between someone like myself and James White. James White in a sense, prides himself on his scholarship in these areas. And he's a decent scholar in, in most of these regards, as far as I've heard. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not questioning that. I don't need to. Um, I'm not insecure in my beliefs enough to have to question his scholarship. I don't have to question his degree or where he got his degree or all those kinds of things like a lot of people try to do. Matter of fact, I always uh, tell people not to do that. That, that. that undermines our position because you're focusing on, on, a, on a red herring, on something that doesn't matter. And this is what we see happening on Twitter right now, unfortunately. Um, I wrote this. I said, imagine what Calvinists would be saying if all the early church fathers regularly extolled the idea of individuals being predestined to effectual salvation until a 4th or 5th century uh, convert from Africa 
who did not know Greek introduced the idea of libertarian free will for the first time. Now, seriously, imagine that. Uh, imagine what Calvinist, you, you guys know how uh, good Calvinists are about um, talking about the historical figures who supported their, their views. They make, they make t-shirts about Calvin is my homeboy and all kinds of things uh, about our early church fathers and other people who say anything that are supportive of what they believe. They're really good at that. Can you imagine if for the first three to 400 years, we had dozens upon dozens of quotes extolling predestination from the individualized uh, uh, perspective of the Calvinistic uh, interpretation. If you had quote after quote after quote affirming total inability and, and uh, unconditional election and irresistible grace, just uh, all of these quotes, just one right after another, um, more so than uh, or even equal to the numbers that we have of actual early church fathers extolling the ability of the human will. Those were John Calvin's words, by the way. That's his findings. Um, then just imagine how often we would be hearing those things from Calvinists. It, it would be all over the place, and everyone knows it. And if we tried to come along and tried to appeal to orthodoxy, if the shoe was on the other foot, you can imagine how Calvinists would be calling us out on that. Um, and that's, that's all we're really doing. We're trying to call Calvinists out on the appeal to orthodoxy. We're not trying to say, as we are erroneously being accused of saying, is that orthodoxy is more important than scripture, that orthodoxy overrules scripture in this regard, that, uh, okay, if I can find more people who believed in libertarian free will than in deterministic uh, philosophy uh, or in co compatibilistic uh, interpretations of the Old Testament, then therefore I must be right and you must be wrong. We're not making that claim. We're just simply saying that if you want to appeal to orthodoxy, then we have every right to question your appeal to that expert and to orthodoxy and to demonstrate to you all the other early church fathers of that time, contemporaries with Augustine, who actually disagreed with him and why they disagreed with him. We can also point to the fact that Augustine was, in fact, a Manichaean for a decade of his life. Uh, and Manichaeanism, though very different than what we know as Calvinism, has some similarities, like the concept of total moral inability from birth, because many uh, Mani, as I've heard it pronounced more regularly now by uh, scholars, Mani actually taught that that because the flesh is evil and bad, that people are born in a condition where they cannot do good things or, or righteous things or good things whatsoever without uh, some kind of a divine um, effectual work. Now, that that's similar to Calvinism. Now, we're not trying to say that what Manichaeanism teaches and all the forms of Manichaean weird uh, Gnostic uh, backgrounds and, and conclusions are exactly equal with Calvinism. We're just simply saying this is one aspect of Manichaeanism that is similar. And since uh, Augustine, by Calvin's own estimation, is the first in history to teach a more deterministic philosophy, and use a grid that's very different theologically than the one we've ever seen, then that should cause us to at least second guess his credentials, to at least say maybe he was influenced here. Maybe the reason he's the first to deny libertarian freedom of the will and to introduce a new grid of sociological interpretation, maybe that should be something that we're, we're, we should question. And so, so I just say, well, imagine how Calvinist, if the shoe were on the other foot here, if, if, if the early church fathers had just tons of quotes supporting compatibilistic uh, versions of determin determinism, just imagine how much they would be using it to support their findings. Well, that's all we're doing because we do have a lot of quotes from the early church fathers establishing this concept of the libertarian freedom of the will and individual human responsibility for their choice to accept or reject. And that's why we've quoted from historians like Lorraine Bettner, uh, Sam Storms, uh, Davenant, and other Calvinistic historians who admit that the earliest church fathers did, quote unquote, extol the ability of the human will. Um, and uh, James White replied to that tweet. And he says, uh, you do not seem to know Greek any better than Augustine did, Leighton. I would suggest dropping that part of your ad hominem. Okay. Now, first, if you don't see the irony in that, um, let me point it out to you. Okay. Because what an ad hominem is, is trying to ignore or dismiss a person's argument based upon a flaw in their character or their ability. Okay. So based upon my flaw, my inability to do Greek very well live and to pronounce Greek very well live, 
Um, though I, I do consider myself uh, trained to do Greek in writing, but not in speaking. That's one of the reasons I refrain from speaking Greek very often, because I know I'm going to mispronounce words. But um, the fact that I have a lack of ability in that area, therefore I'm going to dismiss the argument that was just made. That's an ad hominem. That's dismissing the argument. Okay, And so he is dismissing my argument based upon my lack of ability to do Greek to his satisfaction. So that is an ad hominem. That's the irony of all ironies. He is using an ad hominem to dismiss my argument about Augustine's, the fact that Augustine did not know Greek. Now, my reply to that was to say, I didn't shape the theological landscape of Western Christianity by introducing a new interpretation grid for sociology in the fifth century, James. Augustine's lack of Greek training is just a fact of the matter, like when a DA, DA a district attorney, cross-examines the credibility of an expert witness. It has been said that all of Western theology is a footnote to the work of Augustine. This is because no other writer, with the exception of biblical authors, has had more influence on Christendom. When Martin Luther and John Calvin were accused of teaching new doctrine, they pointed to Augustine as their example of one who had taught the things they were teaching. This is a, this is a quote from Dr. R.C. Sproul of Lingen Inner Ministries. And so I don't think anybody could accuse that as being a biased quote. That is from one of the leading, um, most modern, of course, he's gone on to be with the Lord more recently, but more modern theological scholars and historians from the Calvinistic perspective. And he's acknowledging what James White doesn't seem to want to acknowledge is that Augustine has had a huge influ influence on the way in which modern day uh, church has interpreted and understood certain aspects of sociology, especially as, as it comes to Martin Luther and John Calvin. Now, he can dispute R.C. Sproul's claims. Um, he can sp dispute John Calvin's claims that John Calvin make about the early church fathers, if he would like to. But he can't, in my estimation, just simply dismiss Ken Wilson or myself or others as just being biased um, and, and unwilling to, to listen or unwilling to learn because of our, our tradition or something of that nature. And so that's, that it, at least establishes that aspect of it. Because you're not in, we're going to find out here in a moment, you've never read Clement in Greek. So does that somehow vitiate your conclusions? You just used it. You're the one that raised it. So just wondering what the connection is. The earliest church again if i was trying to make a point that's not already been established by hundreds upon hundreds of scholars before me then you might have a point but it, it, it is a accepted and known fact that the earliest church fathers taught a libertarian form of the freedom of the will um and and only until augustine do we see anything like that change augustine's the first on record to teach something other than the libertarian form of freedom of the will and this concept and idea of de deterministic um, philosophy or what is called compatibilistic Calvinism, those kinds of things. Church fathers, men like Irenaeus or Ignatius, who Ignatius was actually taught by the apostle John himself, and we have some of their writings, they never taught an individualistic Calvinistic view of election. In fact, they repudiated this kind of interpretation in much of their writings. They repudiated this interpretation. Well. That would be interesting to see if he could substantiate that. We're going to find Clement teaching what Leighton says. Okay, we have a lot of quotes from Ignatius and Irenaeus and Athanasius and others that are repudiating the Gnostics of their day who are using verses like John 6.44 and other things to establish a more deterministic interpretation and understanding of how God works. Um, those are just the facts of the matter. Again, um, Ken Wilson's dissertation goes through a lot of these quotes, and I'm looking forward to when White gets to those because I, I think those are um, those are devastating to what he's trying to claim because they clearly show uh, Gnostics and Manichaeans using the very verses that Calvinists use to establish their deterministic philosophies. And you have uh, early church writings like Ignatius and Irenaeus and others who are repudiating that interpretation, who are who are arguing against it. You see, if you look at the homilies of, of John Chrysostom, um, you will see uh, under John 6.44, he even says, the Manichaeans leap onto this text to prove their doctrine. Um, go read it for yourself. It's not it's very easy to find within the, 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 on the internet. 
um, go look for the original sources yourself. I, I welcome for you to look at those things. This he doesn't teach, uh, but anyway. Since I want us to look at one early church father, the Clement of Rome. We're talking about a letter written to Rome. It is not a letter written to Rome. <laughs> I said, he, here he misunderstood me, and I actually tweet him during the broadcast, and he, he calls himself out on it later. So he corrects himself later in this broadcast, which I'm thankful for. But I was not talking about Clement writing to Rome. I was talking about we are discussing a letter written to Rome. The, the Romans 9 debate, okay? So he just simply misunderstood me here. I was talking about the letter we are debating here today is about a letter written to Rome. Obviously, the letter to Clement that Clement wrote, the first Clement, was written to Corinth, and that's what he's trying to say here. Um, first of all, we don't know who wrote this letter. Clement's name has been associated with it traditionally. And, of course, then it was... And that, that's said of a lot of things. We, people say that about books of the Bible, too. Um, there's there's questions of authorship on almost all of the books of the New Testament as people wonder whether it's a pseudo name or somebody's given authorship a credit to Paul that really wasn't Paul or to Peter that really wasn't of Peter, um, and so there there are these kinds of debates among all of these these early ancient writings. Just so you know, that's just a part of it. And for the fact for the and that's one of the reasons that when I quote from a a, a source that's seen by many scholars as a pseudo Clementine writing. Um, it, it's not necessarily wrong to say this is attributed to Clement because it is by many scholars and it, and it has been. Um, and it's still an early church writing. It's still an early writing that is consistent with many of the other writings of that time. And instead of dealing with that issue, he just brings up the fact that it's questionable as to whether it really is of Clement or not. Connected with the Clement that is mentioned by Paul and then tradition ended up later, a hundred years later, um, associating Clement as one of the earliest presbyters. And then eventually, once it was lost sight of the fact that the early form of church government in Rome was not a single bishop. It was a plurality of elders, as is seen in Ignatius's letter to the church at Rome. Um, these are not things that would be a part of Leighton Flowers' world because he doesn't debate Roman Catholics on the subject of papacy on the basis of early church history. But there's just things not relevant to our point of contention. That's, I mean, those are red herrings with regard to our point of contention. Those of us who do are aware of these issues, and so we would know that the identification of Clement in this way um, is traditional. It's not in the text. It's not in the text of the epistle itself. It is a letter written by the church at Rome to the church at Corinth. It's not written to the church at Rome. So he's wrong right, right immediately, is not even aware, and I don't know how you could have read the letter, and I'll be honest with you, I do not believe that in 2015, Leighton Flowers had ever read Clement's epistle, uh, it's called First Clement, Clement's epistle. Again, completely irrelevant to the point of the debate. Uh, all these things are called red herrings. They're just focusing upon um, uh, superfluous side issues rather than dealing with the fact that Clement and or possible early church writings attributed to Clement were clearly, as Calvin said, extolling the ability of the human will. Um, as Lorraine, Bot uh, Lorraine Bettner said, that they were people who, um, well, let, let me just pull up Lorraine Bettner's actual quote so you can see it for yourself. Okay, you can see this is from monergism.com site, which is a Calvinistic source, and this is from Lorraine Bettner. It may occasion some surprise to discover that the doctrine of predestination was not made a matter of special study until near the end of the fourth century. The earlier church fathers placed chief emphasis on good works such as faith, repentance, almsgiving, prayer, submission to baptism, etc., as the basis of their salvation. They, of course, taught that salvation was through Christ, yet they assumed that man had full power to accept or reject the gospel. And so he's acknowledging that the early church fathers, generally speaking, held to this more uh, libertarian perspective that man had full power to accept or reject the gospel. Um, and he, he goes on to acknowledge that some acknowledge the sovereignty of God is recognized, um, but they do not, but they still teach uh, an absolute freedom of the, the human will. So he's finding the same thing that John Calvin found, okay? And this is a reformed, uh, this is the guy who popularized Tulip, the, the acrostic Tulip, uh, Lorraine Bettner. Uh, and so he's a well-known Calvinistic historian that is um, uh, very much um, 
seen as a, a scholar among the uh, among Calvinists. Um, and notice his his findings. He says this cardinal truth of Christianity. So he's calling it a cardinal truth of Christianity, the doctrine of predestination from the Calvinistic perspective, was first clearly seen in Augustine, the great spirit-filled theologian of the West. And so he seems, um, well, even let, let me let me go on and read here. In his doctrines of sin and grace, he went far beyond the earlier the theologians. So he's acknowledging he went far beyond the earlier theologians, the, the people before him. He taught an unconditional election of grace. So in other words, he's acknowledging unconditional election is first seen in Augustine. Okay, not the other early church fathers. It's first established in Augustine and restricted the purposes of redemption to the divine circle, uh, the definite circle of the elect. It will not be denied by anyone acquainted with church history that Augustine was an eminently great and good man uh, and that his laborers and writings contributed more to the promotion of sound doctrine and the revival of true religion than did those of any other man between Paul and Luther. So you can see this guy is not a biased source here. Okay, He is a Calvinist who is, who is, who is esteeming Augustine, but he's also acknowledging something that James White has yet to acknowledge, is that Augustine is the first to introduce these specific types of of soteriological claims. That's the point that uh, has to be established in order for us to continue to have a uh, reasonable dis discourse over the uh, legitimacy of the claims of Augustine during his time. Epistle. And of course, there's all sorts of other Clementine writings that are either pseudepigraphal, um, they're forgeries of later centuries, and then a lot of people confuse Clement of Rome one epistle, with Clement of Alexandria. Lots of epistles, but a lot of weird stuff in those epistles, too. Um, and so you have an epistle written from Rome to the Church of Corinth. If you read it, how could you not know what it was about? Because it is about the Corinthians having kicked their elders out and, and basically have divided the, the faith. Um, and we'll be looking at that in just a moment. So it is not Okay. And let's go ahead to where he looks at it, and because that's what we want to confront here. We want to we want to look at what Clementine, what Clement actually said in his uh, original epistle, uh, the one that scholars do see more likely to be truly of Clement, um, and and not the pseudo sources that again still have some merit to them, um, though there's uncertainty as to their authorship. Um, so keep that in mind as well. There doesn't need to be an explanation of it because it's already the common possession of the people. So notice what is said here. Day and night you were anxious for the whole brotherhood that the number of God's elect might be saved with mercy and a good conscience. So let's look over and see this is what I was this is what I was doing as I was looking at Clement in the original language and that's what got me wondering so I mentioned elected. What was that in the? And so I downloaded the. Had to download the the debate, convert it to MP3, put it in audio note taker. You know, that's what led to all of this. And going, you know, I typed out the quote and went, I ain't in Clement anywhere. And that's when we stumbled on all this stuff. But here, here is the section in Clement. And so here you have uh, ton, arithmon, tone, eclecton, autu. I'll blow it up here. So the, the, the number of his elect, uh, and so you have ice ta sozesai. So that's sozo, to save. So that the number of God's elect together with mercy, and some people feel like there might be a textual issue here in regards to um, uh, seos. Um, but again, if, if you think textual variants are difficult in the New Testament, wait till you start trying to do stuff with um, uh, the early church fathers, uh, where you have very, 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 very different textual flavor as far as the number of manuscripts and how old they are and things like that. Anyway, the point is in passing. Clement can make reference to the doctrine of election, to the number of the elect, that the number of the elect might be saved. 
the terminology is used throughout the book. It is not uncommon whatsoever to read of the elect. For example, uh, in the previous uh, chapter, uh, and especially that shameful and detestable sedition, utterly abhorrent to the elect of God, which a few rash and self-confident persons have kindled to such a pitch of frenzy. Talking about the sedition that had taken place in the church there in, in Corinth. And so you do have regular references to the elect. Now, this can't be the Manichaean elect, because Manny hasn't been born yet. As if we don't know that. Um, and again, that's not the point at all that Ken Wilson or I or anybody else in all of Christendom would ever make. But nevertheless, um, this is the, what I really wanted to highlight because, um, because of the, the, the lenses that certain people have on when they hear or see the word, of the, the word elect, they automatically just assume Calvinism. They assume the Calvinistic interpretation of the elect, meaning that they are elect unconditionally, uh, I would say arbitrarily, but unconditionally prior to uh, creation for reasons that are unknown, uh, for unknown reasons. It's only, it's a secret thing to the counsel of God's glory, and it has nothing to do with the human being whatsoever, their choices, actions, or decisions, or anything of that nature. It's just God uh, ar unconditionally or arbitrarily selects a certain group of people before they're ever born, and these are the ones he effectually regenerates in some ways as to make them, uh, cause them to believe willingly. Uh, in other words, he's not doing that against their will. He's changing their will so that they will want to humble themselves and believe. Now, that's the Calvinistic interpretation. We don't believe that that's the way God works. We don't believe that's what God has done here. We believe that God has created us as responsible creatures, meaning that we are able to respond to his revelation freely, and therefore we're held culpable for those things. And so let's look at the quote he was just talking about there, um, there from Clement, and looking at verse 3 of chapter 2 in Clement. It says, And you, being filled with a holy desire, with excellent zeal and pious confidence, stretch out your arms to Almighty God, beseeching him to be merciful to you, in case you had done anything wrong unwillingly. You contended day and night for the whole brotherhood, that in his mercy and good pleasure the number of his elect might be saved. Now, whenever a Calvinist hears the number of his elect, they hear those chosen before the foundation of the world unconditionally, so as to be saved, uh, effectually. Okay, um, I, I'm not sure that this reference here does anything to support their findings, um, because there is the condition there. They might be saved, not that they certainly will be. Um, and so that doesn't necessarily support the Calvinistic rendering. Um, so how, how does one come to be the elect or chosen of God? That, that's the real point of contention. You can't, again, question beg and just assume elect means what you think it means. You have to establish that with argumentation. And White doesn't take the time to do that here. He might do it elsewhere, but he doesn't do it here. And that's what I'm pu pushing back on. So how does one become elect? Why does God choose someone over another? Okay, so why did God choose to save James White and not uh, the latest atheist that he has debated, who may have gone on to be with the Lord? Okay, so the, the last atheist that has, has died, why did God choose James White and not that person? Well, the Calvinist answer to that question is, well, we don't know. It's not revealed to us. It's a mystery, and it's according to the God's secret counsel. Um, we don't know. And it, we just know this. Calvinists say they know this. It has nothing to do with us personally. It has nothing to do with our faith, our choices, our behaviors, our actions. God's election is unconditionally uh, done. And it's, a, it's an unconditional election. Okay, And so it is completely without regard to the person's decisions, actions, their faith, anything of that nature. Now, we as provisionists, we would say this instead. We'd say God has graciously chooses to save those who put their trust in him. Okay. So we, we don't believe that God unconditionally elects people to be saved. We believe that God graciously chooses to save those who freely choose to put their trust in him. God's election to send the gospel to all people is not conditioned upon their good or bad things that they do. It's, in other words, unconditional of their morality, but it is conditioned upon their faith in him. Now, this is the distinction that sometimes Calvinists are not very good at pointing out. And this is what I'm trying to point out to you so that you see the difference. When we can talk about somebody being saved unconditional of their morality, the good or bad they do, because there's good and bad people both in heaven and hell, uh, relatively speaking. 
there are people who lived more moral lives uh, in, in hell than even some who may be in heaven who live less moral lives. Okay, So it's not about morality, the good and bad they do. So you can say someone is saved unconditional of their moral living as in comparison with somebody else who ends up in, in heaven or in hell. Okay, So that's not the condition. The condition is not the morality, the good or bad they do. So what is the condition? Well, we just don't know what it is if you're a Calvinist. What we would say, no, we know what the condition is. It's faith, okay? So they say it's unconditional. We say the condition is faith. And so we still do believe it's not based upon the good or bad that you do, i.e. your morality, but it is conditioned upon faith. And Calvinists say it was not conditioned on the good or bad you do, and it's not conditioned upon faith, the election. And that's what we're pushing back on. We're saying, yes, it's not conditioned upon the good or bad you do, but it is conditioned upon your faith in Christ. And that's that's the difference between our two world views. So now that we know the two differences, the two sides, we go to Clement's other teachings here in the same uh, epistle, um, and we ask ourselves, what, mo- what is most likely Clement's perspective on this? Is it the more Calvinistic perspective, or is it the more provisionistic ex- perspective? And you be the judge. We'll just go through some of the statements where he talks about the elect or the chosen of God. So let's, let's look at some of other Clement's writings. Uh, in chapter 59, verse 3, it says... God of all flesh, who looks into the abysses, who beholds the work of men, who is the helper of those in danger, the savior of those who have lost hope, who is the maker and bishop of every soul, who makes the nations to multiply upon the earth, and out of all you have chosen those that love you through Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, through whom you have taught us and have sanctified us and have honored us. Now, notice here that he does talk about, again, chosen. That's what the word elect is, to be chosen. Okay, Who has he chosen? You have chosen those that love you. And so clearly, it seems to indicate here at least that Clement believes that the choice is based upon one's love of Christ, love of God. Okay, So this would, this would comport with Paul's teaching that says, um, you perish because you refuse to love the truth so as to be saved, as he said in uh, the, to the letter to the church in Thessalonica, I believe it was. And so when, when you hear things like that, why do they perish? Well, they perish because they refuse to love the truth. In the same way, why, why aren't you chosen? Because you've refused to love God. You've refused to love the truth. So they're chosen based upon what? Some arbitrary, no uh, unconditional reason that we just don't know about? No, they have been chosen because they love him. Okay? So there's one example of where it would side with our interpretation rather than the Calvinistic interpretation. Let's look at some more. Uh, Verse 2 of that same chapter. uh, No, uh, chapter before, 58. Accept our advice, and it will not be repeated by you. For as God lives, and as the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and the Holy Spirit, the confidence and hope of the elect, he who observes in humility with earnest obedience, and repining not, the ordinances and commands given by God, he shall be reckoned and counted in the number of them that are saved by Christ Jesus. So again, he's using the word elect and the word the number of them, okay? In the same way that he used it here in chapter 2, where he's just quoting from, here he's using it again in chapter 58, verse 2, and he's speaking of the elect and being counted in the number of them. And so he says the elect, and then what does he say about the elect? Does he say... They're just, there's no reason that they're elect, or does he say the reasons that they might be elect? Well, it seems here he says the elect, he who observes in humility and earnest and obedience. In other words, he, God, observes their humility, their earnest obedience, their repining not, I mean, they're not, they're not um, fretting, um, in other words, their ordinances, the commands given to them by God, he shall be reckoned and counted in the number of them. So how are you counted in the number of them? You're in humility and earnest obedience. So he's marking out these are the signs of those who will be counted in the number of the elect. So he goes on to say, verse uh, 1 of chapter 52, The Lord of all things, brethren, is in need of nothing, neither does he require anything of anyone except to confess unto him. Okay, so what does the Lord require? Nothing except to confess unto him. And so here's the acknowledging, how does one become elect? You confess your inability to save yourself. And by the way, 
Confessing your inability to save yourself does not merit your salvation. Confessing your inability to merit your salvation is what God requires. It's the only thing that God requires. When you confess, I can't save myself, and put your trust in him, that is the requirement. That is what God requires. And by grace, he chooses to impute the righteousness of Christ upon you. So here it's clearly saying in 52.1 that the only thing God requires is for people to confess their inability to save themselves and to trust in him, which is what you hear provisionists like myself say all the time, because that is the requirement of God. Uh, chapter 35, thir 3 and 4. What therefore are the things that are prepared for them that abide in patience? Okay, so um, he here we would say God does prepare things in advance for his elect, you might say. Okay, so what is prepared in advance? What, what is God predestined? That's what the word predestination is. It's the destination has been decided beforehand. Okay, the destination of who has been decided beforehand? The destination of those who are in Christ through faith has been decided beforehand. So God has decided not who will believe and not believe in Christ. He has decided the destination of those who believe in Christ. And so whoever's in Christ, this is what God has prepared in advance for them. So what, what things are prepared in advance for those who abide in patience? Okay, Let us therefore strive to be found in the number of them that await him. And so... Why, why would Clement say that we should strive to be found in the number of the elect if it's true that we have nothing ultimately to do with that in and of ourselves? See, again, I'm not saying any one of these verses absolutely prove that Calvinism couldn't be right and that Clement's not a, a Calvinistic believer. I'm simply letting the, the facts speak for themselves. I'm just putting it out there for you and saying, which of the two perspectives is most likely what Clement is trying to say, given all that he says with regard to the number of them and striving to be found in the number of them? Uh, that doesn't seem like something a Calvinist would say, that you would strive to be found in the number of the elect because the number of the elect is fixed from eternity past based upon God's eternal decree, not upon whether or not you choose to follow or not. Um, so again, it just, it just maybe seems to lean a little bit more to our side than to theirs, don't you think? Let's just be honest about that. Um, chapter 29, verse 1. Let us therefore approach him with holiness of spirit, lifting unto him the pure and undefiled hands, loving the kind and compassionate Father who has made us a part of his elect. Okay, so just stop right there and think through that for a second. Um, let's look at that real quick. When we see this, do we think that he has made us a part of his elect arbitrarily or with no apparent reason for no apparent reasons? Or has he made us a part of the elect because we have approached him in this way with humility, with love, choosing to follow him? Okay. Let us therefore cleave to the guiltless and the just, verse, uh, ch chapter 46, verse 4 here. Let us therefore cleave to the guiltless and the just, for they are the elect of God. So the elect of God aren't just people arbitrarily picked or unconditionally picked before the foundation of the world. These, these are seen as the guiltless and the just. Now, are they guiltless and just for... Um, for because they're just born that way or because of their own merit. No, they're guiltless and just because they trusted in the, the righteousness of Christ. So when he calls them righteous or just, he's not saying that they're without uh, sin. He's saying that they are, they are righteous by grace through faith. And th those who believe are the elect of God. So they're not the elect of God arbitrarily. They're the elect of God by grace through faith. All right. Verse uh, 1 of chapter 48 let us therefore, matter of fact, this is a whole section from 48, from 1 through 6 here. Um, and this whole section kind of gives a, a, a kind of captures it. And it says, let us therefore remove this thing as quickly as possible and let us fall before the feet of the master and beseech him with tears that he will have mercy and be reconciled unto us and restore us again to the grave and pure conversation of brotherly love. For this is a gate of righteousness open unto life. Now, Look at the imagery. How, how often have we, uh, you, you think of Herschel Hobbes, uh, one of the stalwarts of the Southern Baptist Convention, and one that provisionist traditionalists often quote from, and his illustration with regard to Ephesians chapter 1 and many other passages of a gate that is open for all to enter in. The door, Christ, all to enter into Christ, into the gate, into the sheep pen. And anyone can come into that pen so as to be declared righteous in Christ, in him. 
Well, here's the same kind of uh, illustration. Um, For this is the gate of righteousness, open unto life. It is written, open unto me the gates of righteousness, and I will go into them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter thereby. Now, since many gates have been opened, the gate of righteousness, that is which is in Christ. Now, the in Christ um, vernacular is very Pauline, as we've talked about with Ephesians 1. You're chosen in Christ. So you're not chosen arbitrarily. You're chosen in Christ. How do you get to be in Christ? Look at verse 13 of Ephesians chapter 1. When you heard the message, when you believed, you were marked in him. So you're not marked in him for no apparent reason before you're ever born. You are marked in him when you hear the gospel of truth and you believe it. In the same way, when are you in Christ? When you walk through the open gate and you're marked in him. Okay, You confess him. You, 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 you recognize, I can't save myself. I need him. I need to be uh, trusting in him. I put my trust in him. Happy are all they that enter therein. So look at this. Happy are all they who enter therein. So it is your responsibility to enter therein so as to receive the eternal happiness, the joy that comes from forgiveness in Christ. But you're responsible as to whether you're in Christ, to, be, uh, to strive to be counted among the elect. Okay, that's and so how do you do that? By coming into Christ, by trusting in him. Um, and he goes on, and he who keeps his path straight in holiness and righteousness, quietly performing all their duties, if a man be faithful, and if he be mighty to expound knowledge, and if he be wise in the interpretation of words, if he be pure in deeds, by so much more ought to be humble. Again, talking about humble yourself so as to be saved. God saves the humble, but bring brings uh, low those eyes who are haughty, as Psalm 1827 says. So he doesn't save um, people chosen for no apparent reason. He saves the humble and brings uh, low those eyes who are haughty. And this is, again, the, the, the things that you see from Clement. He's talking about humble yourself so as to be exalted. That's your responsibility. It's not God's responsibility to humble you. That's, that's your responsibility, to humble yourself so as to be exalted. Be the Manichaean elect because many hasn't been born yet. So you can't have that as your source. So let's think you're at Rome and you're writing shortly after the apostolic period. The New Testament may not even be completed while you're writing. What would be the greatest source? For you using terminology such as the elect of God, maybe Romans 8, maybe Paul, you know, that epistle he wrote to your church, which I'm sure has been well read many times already, having arrived what? Well, if you take a pre-70 date, less than 20 years earlier. Uh, 95 date, uh, 40 years earlier. But you know Paul's epistles. That's where this is coming from. That the number of the elect might be saved. Okay, where does he think we think it would come from? I mean, does, I mean I'm just wondering what's going through James's head here. Does he, does he really think that I or other provisionists or traditionalists or non-Calvinists of any sort, Arminians are all thinking Clement has nothing to do with what Paul said in, in, in Rome, in, uh, to, the, to the church in Rome. Uh, but Clement is somehow different from Paul. Is it, does he think that we believe that? Does he think that we don't believe Clement believes the same exact thing that Paul does about? <laughs> the, the whole point of us going through Clement and the other early church fathers is to demonstrate that they didn't think of the elect the way Augustine did. In the way you do now, and yet you're—it's you, almost like you're patronizing me as if I don't believe that Clement got his doctrine from Paul. That's the reason we're appealing to Clement. That's the reason we appeal to all appealing to all of these statements about them, quote unquote, extolling the ability of the human will that you won't acknowledge in your broadcast. It's just. I don't get it, guy. I really don't get it. Maybe, maybe white. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what's going through his mind right now when he's saying it. I really don't. Not that they might save themselves, 
but that the number of the elect would be saved. Not that they might save themselves. Um, James likes to use the term canard when talking about an argument that doesn't apply to his theology. And so I'm going to use that word right now. This is a canard. <laughs> okay. We do not believe that people save themselves. Admitting that you cannot save yourself is not saving yourself. Admitting that you cannot save yourself is admitting that you cannot save yourself. And what James White thinks is that if you have the freedom to admit that you cannot save yourself, as Clement put it, to confess your trust in him, to confess uh, and, 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 and place your trust in him, if that is what saves you, i.e. is what you, you need to be saved, then who needs Christ? If, if just confessing you can't save yourself is enough to save you, then why did Christ need to die? If faith is enough to save you, then why did Christ need to die? Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteous. Why not just say, oh, well, he earned his salvation through belief. That's not what anybody believes, Dr. White. Nobody believes we're saving yourself. And when Paul says to, um, in his sermon to Acts right after, the Pente right after Pentecost, and he says, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Is he being a Pelagian there when he says that? Or is he saying, admit that you can't save yourself. Trust in God so as to be saved. And by grace, he will impute you with the righteousness of Christ. Admitting you cannot save yourself is not saving yourself. And when James White keeps making that kind of argument, I think it's demonstrating that he's not willing to engage with our actual perspective, our actual worldview. Is that a denunciation of Reformed theology? as we were led to believe by Leighton Flowers in the debate? No, the later writings, as we've already admitted, that are considered by some scholars to be pseudo-Clementine writings are the ones that are more clear that I quoted in the debate. And we've already admitted that. We've already acknowledged that. Again, those writings are, you can't just throw them out as if they weren't existent. They, uh, scholars aren't saying they didn't exist back in the, in the second, third centuries. They did. And they are consistent with the, the other teachings of Irenaeus and Ignatius and Athanasius and, and uh, Christensen and so many of the other church fathers that are, quote unquote, extolling the ability of the human will, um, as John Calvin concluded. And so you're not dealing with that argument because you rarely deal with our point of contention, Dr. White. You tend to focus on canards and red herrings and adonyms. And that's what I'm going to continue to push back if you continue to go that direction. Hmm. Doesn't seem to be. What? Okay, here's where he's about to find out. I'm sorry, what is that supposed to mean? He's about to find out that um, that I'd mentioned right. this earlier in the debate. So he's, uh, I think Rich is way. pointing it out to him. And so now this he's about to play the section program, folks. in the debate where uh, he does ask about Clement well, and the but elect. that's... That's right after the section that I... Uh, so did I go back to that? All right, let's see what we got here. We can all discover together. Uh, no, I'm not. Okay. Um, would you be surprised to discover he speaks ah! off that time and that we're, we're continually learning, um, at least the, the, okay, the okay, podcast. Okay, okay, okay. Boy, the quality of the audio is not... Is it all right on that end? Because maybe it's just the small earpiece or something like that, but I just, I just didn't... Keep listening far enough. I thought we transitioned on, so let's go. Oh, no, no. Not, no they, they would probably try to say that, well, Sam Storms, for example, argues in progressive revelation that we have learned more since that time and that we're, we're continually learning. Um, at least the, the, the podcast, the Unplugged podcast, those guys talking, that's what they... they have you read about. all of Clement, sir? I'm sorry? Have you read all of Clement? Um, I, no, I've not. Okay. Um, would you be surprised to discover he speaks often of the elect? Well, so does the Bible. That doesn't okay. mean it would obviously. It, so he must have understood it in your way. Well, how do you interpret then the the, the passage that I just wrote? You can, the you, one you, that says can, everyone has free will. How you do can you ask me that, that? You can ask me that question when it's your turn. Okay, so he's he's referring back to the quote in the debate when he asks, um, do, "Are you aware that Clement speaks of the elect?" And and I point out, as I should, that the Bible speaks of the elect too. That's not that that's not the point of contention. We, we all believe the Bible speaks of the elect, just like we all believe the Bible speaks about predestination. We all believe the Bible speaks about election and, and, and all those different terms that Calvinists like to use. Um, as David Allen says, uh, Calvinists have the same vocabulary, but a very different dictionary. And so just because the word is used doesn't prove your doctrine, Dr. White. 
That's the point. And, and you did the exact same thing that I was accusing you of there in my interview with Ken Wilson, is that you take a quote out of its context and you say, oh, look, he says the number of the elect. And what does that remind you of? That reminds me of Paul in Romans chapter 8. Therefore, it must mean Calvinism. What? Okay. That, 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 that's not an argument. That's just a presumption. And unless you can establish that Clement was thinking the same way that you are, when it comes to the number of the elect, i.e. that God chooses unconditionally certain individuals for no apparent reason before the foundation of the world and effectually changes their nature to make them believe in the gospel, then, then all of that's just presumption on your part. It's tradition on your part, as you like to accuse us of relying on tradition. That's what I'm saying. I think that you are looking at Clement the same way that you look at Paul with your tradition, with your lenses, Calvinistic lenses on, and therefore misinterpreting Clement in the same way that you've misinterpreted Paul. I hope this has helped you to see the differences between our perspectives. God bless you. We'll talk to you next time. Have a great day. Be good.